Joining me right now is the Bonson Group founder and managing partner, David Bonson. He is also the author of the book, There's No Free Lunch, 250 Economic Truths. David, it's great to have you. Thanks very much for joining us this weekend. Thanks so much for having me, Maria. So I view Thanksgiving as sort of the kickoff to year end, as well as a look into 2022. How are you expecting this market to do toward year end? We've got the S&P 500 up 25 percent in 2021. Can it continue? Well, it's interesting. I think that uh, we view it the same way that Thanksgiving sort of starts the process of viewing year end planning and then your perspective going into the new year. And I think going into the new year, p investors have to expect lower returns next year than we've had here these last couple years. And I think a big reason for that is valuations, the starting point. Uh, you got a great recovery this year in stuff that had been highly distressed. Uh, our two largest sector weightings are energy and financials, and they were the two top performing sectors here so far this year. Um, and so a lot of that recovery trade ha bounce back from the COVID moment has sort of played out. Uh, but going into 2022, the one thing I don't think people can count on is technology to continue leading the way. Uh, you've already seen a lot of the tech names, the so-called work from home type names have gotten creamed from their highs. And, and Fang seems to still be the recipient of that. I'm very skeptical that that continues next year, Maria. Yeah, especially since we do have some headwinds in terms of higher interest rates, right? And plus, we don't know who's going to be the overseer of banks, which is an incredibly important position for that financial services sector. We know that Jay Powell was reappointed this week and uh, Lyle Brainerd will be the vice chairman of the Federal Reserve. How do those changes affect putting money to work uh, as uh, we do expect rates to start moving higher? Uh, second half of the year, 2022. Well, I always like having some contrary opinions, and I do think that I'm a little different than much of the street on this that is worried about the Fed getting forced to tighten or the Fed taking a bit more hawkish position. I think you should expect some more hawkish rhetoric. They kind of have to say some of that. But when it comes to action, I just simply don't believe it. I don't believe that the Fed is going to all of a sudden become the big tighteners of monetary policy that they were in 2017 and 2018. I think that the way that the corporate credit market revolted against that has sort of uh, made Powell very hesitant to go there. I think that our society, governmental spending, corporate spending, housing market, and you mentioned some of the stock market sectors, they're very dependent on those very low interest rates that help feed high valuations. I don't think the Fed is going to move off of that. But what will happen is valuations just can't keep expanding. So profits grow, margins continue to be quite impressive. But at some point, I think you're going to see out of favor sectors surprise people like energy did this year. Consumer staples is one that we have our eyes on. So what about energy in the year ahead, David, now that President Biden has released 50 million barrels of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? President Trump, of course, bought all that oil when oil was at $31 a barrel, filling up that reserve. Uh, but it hasn't had much of an impact on the price uh, since Biden made the move. Markets are incredibly smart, incredibly efficient. They know that move was a joke. It was token. It was a headline. It was a press release, but it was not substantive to the supply challenges we face with oil and gas in our country. Um, the fact of the matter is those strategic reserves are meant to be for real emergencies, and $70 oil is not a real emergency. It was a politically driven thing that has no impact on supply demand dynamics. The fact of the matter is that energy was the top performing sector in the first year of the Biden administration, and President Trump was quite friendly to the U.S. energy sector, and it was the worst performing sector in his administration. So markets have a funny way of being very disconnected from politics at times. Yeah, it's a great point. What do you want to do then if you own energy at this point, oil stocks as well? 
I think some of the producers have gotten pretty stretched. They've had great runs, and we like a lot of those names. But our focus, Marie, and I've talked to you about this in the past, we really like the midstream sector where they're just simply transporting the oil and gas. You mentioned when President Trump bought oil at $30 for strategic reserves, and you recall that we had no place to store oil during the second and third quarter of the COVID moment. And these companies were able to provide storage facilities as well as transportation. Right now, we have such a huge opportunity to be exporting liquefied natural gas and more safely and environmentally safely moving oil and gas within our country. These are high yielding sectors that have really improved their financials. So we like the midstream part of oil and gas, those that are transporting. What's, what's your take on the macro story, David? You know, we had some pretty good blow-ups in retail this week. Nordstrom losing a third of its value. The Gap losing a quarter of its value because of uh, weaker-than-expected quarterly numbers. Uh, does this give you any indication of this spotty retail backdrop? I know consumers have a lot of money uh, to spend after pent-up demand during the pandemic, but wages are being cut into with inflation. Yeah, but I don't think that the Nordstrom's and Gap number was uh, systemic. Uh, we see a very strong appetite for consumer activity, and that's a trend that we never bet against because I have never in my adult life seen American consumers unwilling to spend as long as they're able. Consumer spending is always more about credit than it is appetite. People just love to buy things in our country. Gap and Nordstrom's had idiosyncratic problems because other retailers had actually done quite well. So I think it had more to do with a story on their own balance sheet. Their, you know, Gap in particular is more levered. Um, I, I, I'm not uh, an investor in the consumer discretionary space. I don't think I'm good at guessing what teenage girls are going to buy next quarter. But the fact of the matter is that financially, a lot of those stories have a lot of debt. And that speaks to one of our other themes, that it's a good time to look to less levered areas because we think that leverage has really played out. All right. We will leave it there. David, it's great to see you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Happy Thanksgiving. And to you, have a great rest of your Thanksgiving weekend. David Bonson joining us there.